Amen. Amen. Hallelujah indeed. Hey, welcome to this third Sunday in Advent where uh, we're not talking about Christmas. We're actually talking about sex. <laughs> Sorry, that's what a way to open a service up, right? A message. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, in fact, take your Bibles and open them up if you would with me, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Um, next Sunday, we've got a Christmas message. It's going to be awesome. You can, well, I don't know if the message will be awesome. The service is going to be awesome. But um, we're still making our way through the book of 1 Corinthians, and so we'll take a break next Sunday because it's Christmas. Definitely want to give attention to that, um, and then we'll head back into our series. But for the meantime, take your Bibles, open them up to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1960, Roger Corman produced a film called uh, Little, The Little Shop of Horrors. Anybody remember this? 19- okay, how about some of you all 80s children remember this version that came out 20 years later? Any more people? Yeah, I heard that, Scott. This is one of your favorites. Yeah, a little shop of horrors. And uh, (laughs) Rick Moranis, um, play me the banjo guy, Tim Martin, Steve Martin. um, Someone else in that one. He played the dentist, a bunch of famous cast characters. Anyways, the movie, both of them, tell the story of the struggling plant store. Plant store is struggling, struggling, struggling to stay open and it, but it was saved from bankruptcy when they wound up in possession of a new hybrid kind of Venus flytrap, which they named Audrey Jr. Okay? Some of you remember this. Because of the uniqueness of this plant, I mean, it was a very rare plant, people got wind of it, that they had this really rare plant. So people started to flock from all around to see this very rare type of Venus flytrap. And all of a sudden, this, this plant shop that was on the verge of bankruptcy saw this boon in business. What customers don't realize, however, I think there's a musical about this too, isn't there? Yeah, okay. What customers don't realize, actually, this was a musical. What customers don't realize about the plant, however, is that the plant actually only feeds on human blood. Okay, so in the 1960s version, when you when you see him, he accidentally the guy accidentally drips some blood into the uh, plant, and the plant goes, "Feed me." You guys have heard that before? Okay, feed me. That's where it comes from. Little house, little shop of horrors, 1960. And while the plant owner is able to feed the plant at first, what he doesn't realize is, is as he's fed, the plant starts to grow, and it requires more and more blood to satisfy its hunger. And because the store owner is really desperate to save his business, he keeps feeding the plant more and more human blood. Which you can imagine gets pretty out of hand. It's, it's, a, it's a very dark comedy. And, <laughs> and so the plant owner actually ends up finding himself, in, in order to save his business, enslaved to the hunger of this blood-eating plant. Audrey Jr., what ends up happening, ends up controlling the lives of the shop workers, reducing them to virtual slaves of its insatiable hunger. This movie, this story, is a great illustration about the effects and the allure of sin in people's lives, right? What initially looks to be kind of an innocent thing often grows, and for those that feed it, they only end up becoming enslaved to it. Why about this? Why all this? Well, because in, in the book, in the, in the part of 1 Corinthians we're going to be talking about, Paul is addressing a congregation who is enslaved to sin in some regards. And specifically today, he's going to be talking about sexual sin that's, that's, that's made its way into the church, that is influencing the church, that is growing in its appetite among the people, if you will. And Paul's going to address this. And so, here we are, 1 Corinthians 6. We're going to dive in and read verses 12 through 20. At this time, Zach Claude is going to come and lead us in this reading. Would you stand out of respect for the reading of God's Word? 1 Corinthians 6, 12 through 20, and then we'll talk about it. All right. Good morning, church. Good morning. So, 1 Corinthians 6, 12 through 20. I have the right to do anything you say. But not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. You say, food for the stomach and stomach for food, and God will destroy them both. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. 
By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Hmm. Shall then I take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said the two will become one flesh. But whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body. But whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. This is God's word. You may be seated. Thanks, Zach. And happy anniversary. <laughs> Hopefully when you came in, you received a bulletin with some notes in there. I'd encourage you to pull those out and track with me because there is some stuff we got to talk about. This is a great text. Great, great text. I'm really excited to preach on because I get to be up here and watch all of you get really uncomfortable. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. No, we're, we're heading into a, a section of 1 Corinthians where Paul talks, deals a lot with what's going on in the culture sexually. Now, I wanna, I'm going to give you um, a bit of fair warning. Today's message is going to be PG on purpose because I realize it's sort of the first time we're diving into this. And, uh, however, ne next Sunday we got the Christmas message, but the next three weeks, no guarantees. There is junior church if you don't, if, if for some reason that uh, you want to not have this conversation this early. But something you need to know about me when it comes to sex is I am quite comfortable talking about it. Um, to some, it's embarrassingly, com uh, embarrassingly comfortable. My, and I, the reason why I am and the reason why I came to be this way, partly because of some of the things I studied in college, but what I learned in doing 20 years of work, youth, youth ministry, youth work, is that when the church doesn't talk about sex, the world does for them. And... My personal conviction is that one of the reasons our culture, our society is in the sexual predicament it is, is because the church for a long time treated sex as a, ooh, this is this thing we don't talk about ever. And when we don't talk about it, Satan is all too happy <laughs> to present all kinds of things when it comes to, so I, I don't mind talking about it. I'm really comfortable talking about it and i got to be honest with you. I'm trying, I'm going to tell you, I'm, I'm, I'm restraining myself in making this message PG. I'm just going to say that now. Because again, I believe that the church needs to have a biblical understanding when it comes to sex. Because guess what? That was God's invention. Did you know that? Did you know that the first sexual thought in all of eternity was God's? We're going to talk about it today because the text talks about it. And we don't skirt the text. We dive right in. We love God's word. And so we're going to talk a lot about it. Um, and I'm not only very open about it, but I'm very gracious with it too, because something else I know as well is that many of us, probably actually a majority of us, have, have, have firsthand experience with, sexual, with some kind of sexual brokenness, right? And so I'm very comfortable talking about it, and I'm very gracious in talking about it because it reaches into all, many of our, many of our lives, not all of our lives, in some way, shape, or form. But... I want to focus on the text for a little bit before we in, in diving into that. What's the big idea? What big ideas is Paul trying to get the Corinthians to understand? The first one, I think, is this. That true freedom would be found by exercising self-control, not in exerting one's rights. The, the Corinthians had this saying, I have a right to do anything, Paul says. I have a right to do anything. They had another saying, uh, food for the stomach and stomach for the food, and God will destroy them both. You know, the Corinthians, this, this phrase, this all things are lawful for me, was a popular phrase in Corinth at the time. Similar to another phrase, a phrase we hear in our culture, my body, my choice. Okay? The Corinthian rationale went something like this. If, if my body's hungry, feed it. If I'm thirsty, drink. If I lust, indulge it. And before long, the situation was kind of out of control in the culture, but it also had crept those things that crept into the church. In fact, an early writer, uh, a writer from not too far from this, Demosthenes, said something to this effect. We keep prostitutes for pleasure. We keep mistresses for the day-to-day -day needs of the body. We keep wives for the beginning of children and for the faithful guardianship of our homes. 
So that guy has got not one, but two side chicks, is in other words, right? Like there's this, he's got his wife, his mistress, and his prostitute. That was the norm. That was very normalized in that culture, this idea of free sex and that sort of thing. And the Corinthians were a part of this culture that embraced this idea, that embraced this open sexuality. In fact, the Corinthian church was in a city that had a temple to the goddess Aphrodite. A God whose worship, in order to worship her, was to have sex with these temple prostitutes. So the Corinthians were very much marinated in the sexualization of their culture, kind of like we are today, if we're honest. And like it was all around them. It's all around us, right? I don't got to scroll but like two seconds before I see an ad that's targeted towards me as a middle-aged, 40-year-old, red-blooded American man that's trying to entice me sexually to do something. What the Corinthian church failed to realize, though, is that by indulging these so-called freedoms, these freedoms to do these things, right, what they were in fact doing was actually becoming slaves to those things, their primal sexual urges. In other words, they weren't gaining their freedom, they were losing it because they're giving into the flesh. And Paul's saying, you know, you guys say these things, but you know what? True freedom is going to be found by exercising self-control, not in indulging yourselves in what your the culture allows you to do around you in other words in paul's letter to the church in rome he elaborates on this he expounds on this by laying this i down this idea that people are going to serve somebody him and bob dylan you're going to serve somebody it might be the devil it might be the lord but you're going to have to serve somebody that comes from the bible i think well kind of sort of not really but in the book of romans make sure i got my book my romans chapter six what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone to obey him as slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey, whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you wholeheartedly obeyed the form of teaching to which you were entrusted. You have been set free from sin, it says. And have become slaves to righteousness. In other words, slave, being a slave to righteousness is what is actually freedom. Not being a slave to our baser instincts. And so Paul's trying to get the Corinthians to see this. So secondly, so firstly, the freedoms, you know, like not all freedom is freedom, right? Secondly, what's done with the physical body has spiritual implications. In this text in verses 13, 15 through 17, Paul draws on this idea that there is somewhat of a mystical union a mystical connection between our physical bodies and our spiritual bodies, right? Our physical bodies and our spirits. Paul leaning again into that popular saying of the day, you say food for the stomach and the stomach for food, but God will destroy them both. The body was not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And 15 goes on in verse 15. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? He's already talked about this, hasn't he? This idea that you all are the dwelling place of God because of what Jesus has done. The God of the universe now lives inside of you because of your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. There's this mystical, weird union between our physical bodies that has spiritual implications. And Paul is warning them of this danger of placing too much emphasis on one over the other. Because again, people are more than just material. Judah is more than just hair. I'm just kidding. And skin and smiles and teeth. You know, Judah and myself, Abby, all of y'all, all of you all, like you have a body and a soul that are both important and are tied together in a very mysterious and complex way. You see, and what Christianity teaches, and this is important to get to grasp too, is like what Christianity teaches is not resurrection from the body, but resurrection of the body. Like, we have a body that will one day be resurrected. And in the meantime, what happens to one, either our body or our spirit, also affects the other also. Like, when one, one hurts, the other hurts also. How many of you recall a time maybe in your life where you were so depressed or anxious about something, it made you physically sick? Okay? Something in your spirit was so wrought with anxiety, fear, depression, sadness, sorrow, like you were, something physical happened as a result. 
I remember a time when I got so anxious, I actually threw up. Like my spirit was so crushed and anxious that I, bleh. sorry. Or sometimes, some of us, we experience hunger to the degree that we get not just hungry, but hangry. Anyone ever else been hangry before? Yeah. Where you are, your body is so hungry for food, you're just angry. I had that happen to me several to my wife when I go out, we love to go out to eat for our dates. And it's like sometimes if we're, on, if we're on a long road trip and it's been a long day and we go to a restaurant, we sit down and the food takes an hour to get there. By the time it gets there, I'm not just hungry, I'm hungry. Some of you know what that feels like. And Paul recognizes that there's this, there's this connection between both our physical bodies and our spiritual selves. Because just as there's this connection between our bodies and our spirits, for those who are in Christ, this text teaches, there is a spiritual link between the believer and the Savior who now lives in that body. You know, you know I've, heard, I've heard recently people dog on this idea in, the, in uh, church circles about like, oh, the Bible never says ask Jesus to come into your heart. Yeah, the Bible never says that, right? The Bible never says to blow your nose either, but we do it. But there's this idea in the scriptures here that when, when, when we put our faith and trust in Christ, Christ comes and lives inside of us. And that's kind of the metaphor we use to associate with that sometimes. And what's important to remember is that that is true. Paul teaches that it's true that when you place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, your body is no longer your own. It's been bought at a price and it is inhabited by the God of the universe as his earthly temple. We've seen that before in First. Corinthians, and so what's done with the body has spiritual implications. Thirdly, and especially in light of the context of this text, sexual activity is unique in its ability to affect both body and soul. Again, from verse 16, he goes on, he says, Do you not know that one, he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in, in body? For it is said the two will become one flesh. Remember, there was this worship happening in that culture where people would go to these temple prostitutes, have sex with them, fulfill the lust of the, of the body, fulfill um, their thirst for sex. And it, what he, Paul is saying is this is unique. There's something, I believe there's unique, there's something unique about this connection that people have when they engage in this kind of activity. And he alludes to, he's trying to teach the Corinthians, going to the very first pages of scripture to confront the sexual norms of the culture that was surrounding them at the time, because they had crept their way into the church. And the kinds of sexual activity that surround the surrounding culture went way beyond God's design for it. So Paul goes all the way back to Genesis 2 to remind the people of the creation account, what had happened. And this is important for us in forming a, a theology, I believe, a good theology of sexuality. Genesis 2. God creates the physical order of things. Okay? You've, some of you have undoubtedly heard this. He creates the moon, the sun, the stars, the sky, the animals, all the things, the day, the night, the light, the dark, all the things. The pinnacle of it he creates is mankind. And as he's creating all of these things, what does he say after creating each one? It's good. It's good. It's good. Then he creates man and he says what? It's very good. However, God recognizes that it's not good for man to be alone. Interesting. And so what does God do? God puts Adam into a deep sleep and out of him he creates Eve. To be his wife, his spouse, his lifelong partner in, in life. And when God presents to Adam this absolutely stunning creature to be his lifelong partner, Adam goes, whoa, man. And that's why they called them women. No, I'm just kidding. Adam says this in Genesis 2. He says, this is now, this is verse 23 of chapter 2. This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman for she was taken out of a man. For this reason, does this sound familiar? Man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and they will become one flesh. Paul refers to the creation account in order to teach the church that what happens during sexual activity is something incredibly precious. And I would argue in that in very sacred. 
And it's something God designed to be shared between two people who have been united in marriage. Paul knew that when, when people engage in sexual activity, whatever it is, it's an experience unlike anything else on earth. And because Paul is trying to help the church see that God, that God now was living inside of them as their earthly temple, right? Uniting themselves in a way to someone outside of God's design for sexuality should be wholly unthinkable. Sexuality, human sex, sexual activity is unique in its ability to affect both body and soul because in it, a bond is formed, established, or cultivated between two people on a level nowhere else experienced in the human experience. You know, during intercourse, like, like two bodies come together in a way that they share a depth and level of intimacy that is unknown to any other experienced man. One that can be so pleasurable at times, it can often be compared to that of a spiritual experience. And guess what? That's how God designed it. I mean, we're supposed to like it? Yes! God created it good. It's a good thing. What happened? It got tainted. It got broken. And Paul knew that. When sex is done right in the context of God's design for it and covenant marriage with the full emotional engagement of both participants, that experience rivals any other high on earth. But when it's done wrong, when it's done outside of God's design, what ends up happening oftentimes is a trail of brokenness, broken hearts, broken lives, broken families, broken relationships. And so sexual activity is unique in its ability to affect both body and soul. And I think Paul is trying to teach the church this because the surrounding culture was teaching them something different. Indeed, our surrounding culture teaches us something different. Now, I'm going to sidebar here to say something that we all need to hear as well in this room, okay? Because I know that this is probably, for some of us, this might, might be uncomfortable, Right? And that's okay, I get that. It's okay when God's word makes us uncomfortable and all that. But I think there's something really important that we stop, need to stop, all of us need to stop and remember here when it comes to this. If you have your Bibles open if to 1 Corinthians, look back with me in, in, in the last section, what Paul leads up to here in verse 11 of this chapter. What does he say? Actually, I'm going to back it up. I'm going to back it up even more. Verse 9 in chapter 6. Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived. Uh, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor ad adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanders, nor swindlers will inherit th the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. So what, did you hear what Paul's saying? Like there was male prostitutes in the first century church. What? That is what some of you were. There were people who struggled with homosexual attraction in the first century church. What? Paul says, that's what some of you were. This is, these are things that God's saying, like or the Bible is teaching, like all of these things. Yeah, but guess what, folks? Because of your faith in Christ, your sexual brokenness does, not, does no longer define you. What defines you now, or what should define you now? Christ Jesus. That's what the scriptures, I believe, is teaching us. Like there was all kinds of sexual brokenness in that, in that church. And yet, Paul is saying, guess what, though? The good news is, however your past has been, right, that doesn't define you anymore. Why? Because you have been what? Sanctified. Right? You've been, which means set apart. You've been set apart for a person, purpose. You were justified. You know what that means? I like to say this. It's just, it, when it comes to justification, that's a church word. Justified is just as if I'd never sinned at all. There's this idea that Paul preaches here that, you know what? If you're in Christ, anything in your past, like Christ has paid for that, right? Which means you therefore should not feel guilt about it. Now, sometimes in the Christian life, we feel guilty. We feel, we, have, we get a feeling when we do something wrong. 
where God, we might, we might do something sexual or any of these other things. We might do something greedy or we might drink too much. We might slander someone or swindle someone. Like, those are things that sometimes the Christian church here would engage with or at least would struggle with, would continue to struggle with. Sanctification is a process, but that was something that no longer defined them. What defined them was who they were in Christ Jesus. Why do I stop here and sidebar for so long on this point? Because, folks, I realize in a, in a congregation like this, the majority of us, have felt the effects of sexual brokenness in one form or another. Very few of us probably have any stones to throw when it comes to this, if we're completely and utterly honest. Like there's, why? Because there's this innate nature for us to want those things. And oftentimes the world is all too happy to engage with us in that, and we can be allured into that. But what we need to realize in light of a text like this We'll talk a little bit about this in the, in the conclusion as well, is that if you've experienced that any form of, of sexual brokenness like I have or have been affected by it like I have or many other people in this room have been, like God's grace is for you. Like you're not defined by that if you're in Christ. Because as Paul would teach in the book of Romans, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Like you, you know, maybe, maybe some of us here struggle with shame or guilt over something that in our past, you know, we're like, oh, guess what? If you're in Christ and you've been just like, you've been justified, it's just as if that never happened according to God's eyes. That's important for us to remember because sometimes when it comes to this topic, shame and guilt is one of the things that, can, that oftentimes comes into our lives. We listen to the enemy, the accuser of the brethren lob accusations at, at us, and it doesn't drive us to the cross, it drives us away from the cross. And what Paul is teaching here, what I think the, the epistles teach, what I think the gospel teaches, is that no, once you're in, if you are in Christ, there is therefore now no condemnation, which means that if you're hearing a condemning voice and you're in Christ, it's not Christ's voice. And it's really important to share here. Some of the greatest news you can hear if you have been, if you've, if you've had, if sexual brokenness has intersected your life in some way, shape, or form, whether you've done something you regret, whether someone has done something to you that you feel weird about or that you have some um, trauma over, is that that no longer defines you in Christ. You've not only been forgiven, but the God of the universe has given you the gift of his Holy Spirit. And even despite our sexual brokenness, God has said, you know what? Those are the people I wanted to redeem. Those are the people I want to live inside. I want to dwell in. <sighs> oh, man, I get caught up in that. Like I said, I could talk about sex a lot, and that's, I'm okay doing it, and I'm just, I want to be very open about that. Lastly, f number four, physical bodies are sacred space for God and should be treated thusly. Now, um, I've, we've kind of beleaguered this point already, but there is this sense in which this text is very applicable to us in another way. In that, Paul says here, do you not know that your bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Now, he's most definitely talking about the, the sexual stuff that's happening in the church, but there is a sense in which you can derive from this text that even things like Overeating, smoking, <laughs> workaholism affects our bodies, right? And we should be mindful of how we care for our bodies. There was a gym once um, that had a sign up. It said, we have courses to make grown men young and young men grown. <laughs> Physical bodies are sacred space for God and should be treated thusly. So how can we, how do we, how do we, look at a passage like this in conclusion and challenge us in living counter to the culture, right? I think the first thing I want to encourage us to think about is this, is don't exert your freedom only to end up in slavery. If something's like, oh yeah, I am free to do this. I am free to do this. Well, I would ask the same question that is kind of implied in the text, right? Everything's permissible, but not everything is beneficial, Everything's permissible for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. In other words, is 
what is alluring you as some kind of freedom to be exercised, something that is going to be beneficial to you or others, or is it just one more thing that you're going to become enslaved by? Like your workaholism. Or like our, like our addiction to food sometimes. Or, <laughs> or sex. Don't exert a freedom only to end up in slavery because sin is most often slavery disguised as freedom. That's important for us to realize and for us to understand, right? Ever since the 60s, much of our society has, has adopted this mentality that if it feels good, do it. Anybody heard that before? If it feels good, do it. You only live once. Yellow, you only live once. <laughs> Sorry. And when you adopt that sort of mentality, it's kind of like, oh yeah, I can just do whatever I want because I'm only going to live once, right? Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we may die. But what ends up happening oftentimes is when we adopt that in our minds, we actually end up in slavery to the thing that's driving or that's drawing or calling to us. Almost like a siren's call, if you will. And we're not, be, we're not only susceptible to this view of our sexual desires, right, our sexual instincts, but overeating something in our, of a problem in our culture. Shoot, that's my problem. <laughs> One of my problems, drinking too much, chain smoking, drug use, prescription drug use, or, or tr- prescription drug abuse, I should say, workaholism. All of these things affect our bodies and are oftentimes encapsulated in the allure of this is a freedom that we can enjoy. Thomas Huxley once said this, he said, a man's worst difficulties begin when he is able to do as he likes. <laughs> oh, Philip Brooks clergyman from the 19th century said this one says, no man in this world attains to freedom from any slavery except by entrance into some higher servitude. There is no such thing as an entirely free man conceivable. We all worship something. We are all going to serve somebody. Who do you want it to be? What do you want it to be? Is that going to lead you to freedom or is it really just going to lead you to slavery? If you're a slave to righteousness, guess what? Like the Apostle Paul said in Romans, you're going to be truly free. But if you exercise freedoms that go beyond the bounds of what God has designed, guess what? It's going to lead you to slavery. It's going to lead you to broken hearts, broken lives, brokenness in general. And God doesn't want that for you. He doesn't because he loves you. He wants you to be truly free. Secondly, make every effort to care for your temple. B, make every effort to care for your temple. And it, you know, and this is something that is kind of, again, an extension of this, of this verse, this idea that, like, or this scripture passage today is our body is a physical extension of Christ in the world, right? We should do everything we can or make every effort to care for our temples, our bodies, the bodies God has given us. Why? Well, because while we are on this earth, God uses us to advance the mission of his kingdom. God uses us to build and establish the kingdom of Jesus on earth, uses us to be a blessing for, to care for one another, to care for the earth, to care for people. And so as much as we can, we need to make every effort to care for our bodies, the temples God has given us. One time a retired couple decided they wanted to get in, they wanted to get in shape again, and so they decided that they were going to start by walking two miles a day. And so in order to make sure that they were going to walk the full two miles, they, they picked a, a country road and they decided we're going to walk a mile down so that we have to walk the mile back. And so they decided to do this. They chose to walk a mile out on this lonely country road so they'd have no choice but to walk back to make sure they got in those full two miles. At the one mile mark on their first venture, the man turns to his wife and says, are you doing okay? Do you think you can make it back all right? Or, or are you too tired? And the woman says, oh, no, I'm fine. I'm, I'm not tired. I can make it fine. Good, he replied. I'll right here. You go back, get the car, and come get me. <laughs> I, think there's, I think there's implications here. It's not just about sex, but it's like, you know, like, and this is something I'm, I struggle with. It's like, man, I like me some eats. <laughs> Especially around this time, y'all making these cookies and stuff, and I'm like looking like Santa. Right? <laughs> Minus he's got more hair. <laughs> but 
But to, to, care, to take care of our temples, right, is something that affects our soul, our minds. And as much as we can, it, we are in mortal bodies. Our bodies see decay. We get sick. We're part of this broken, fallen world. We get old. You know, some of y'all are older than me, and I'm older than some of y'all. I'm starting to feel it too. But in the meantime, we care for ourselves to honor God. The Mark Twain, Mark, not the, Mark Twain once said, the only way to keep your health is to eat what you don't want, drink what you don't like, and do what you'd rather not. <laughs> Sometimes that might mean taking a walk. Well, and lastly, just a point of application here to think in light of this text is when it comes to sexual temptation, don't just walk away, run! <laughs> run, why? Well, because our culture is constantly reaching out to our hearts and minds through through media, through the internet, to like try to allure us and, and take our minds places. I mean, whether it's, I mean, there's all kinds of stuff going on that makes it just like, <coughs> excuse me, sexual temptation is so incredibly easy to indulge in these days. I mean, like a couple clicks of a mouse even, right? We can, we can indulge those things. God knows that sex, sexual temptation is very powerful, which is why, again, I think it's saying, don't just run, flee, or don't just, don't just walk, flee from sexual immorality, it says in verse 18. We marinate in a culture of sex, and it's one of these things where it's like, we got to be on guard against what's going on in our hearts and minds so that it doesn't get a hold of our lives and taint our flavor. I want to tell you a story that reminded me about this this week. Any of y'all like Texas Roadhouse? Oh, I love me some Texas Roadhouse steak. Yeah, love it. The other week, my wife and I, we were up in Jackson. We were on a date, and oh, we were with the Steiner. We ended up, yeah, we were with you guys. I didn't, we didn't tell you this story. We, we ran into them at the Texas Roadhouse, had a little impromptu double date. Anyways, while we're going into the restaurant, this guy comes in with this tray of cupcakes. You guys remember this? A big tray of cupcakes. Someone was having a birthday party or something. He had his hands full. My wife was like, oh, let me help you with that, opening the door and and he goes through the door, and jokingly, he, she tells him, well, that'll, you know, there's a tax of, of cupcakes for this, this act of kindness. Ha, 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 I laugh, off the guy goes, and whatever. We get in, we eat our steak, okay, and we get done, and we're almost done, and this guy comes to us with a couple of cupcakes. He gave us some cupcakes. Put some, I know, he's so nice. They had a birthday party, had extra cupcakes, and he was just really kind. Well, we didn't eat all the cupcakes. We kept one. And as is always the case at Texas Roadhouse, we had to go home with a, a doggy bag, a, a box, you know, because we had, didn't eat all the steak. So we had two things in the box. We had a, a steak. It was pretty dry. It wasn't really juicy because my wife doesn't like it like that. She likes her steak like she likes her sand, dry, pretty much. <laughs> Which I don't think is steak at that point. I'm just like saying, I'm like, give me, give me the blood. I'm like the Venus flytrap. Okay. <clears throat> But dry steak, cupcake in a box. Take it home, put it in the fridge, don't think about it. <clears throat> Next day we're thinking, oh, we'll just make this up. And we usually cut it up and make it in a little day after fajita type things. We get in. We get, we, next day we open up the box and my wife hands me the cupcake. It smells a little weird. <laughs> but I take a bite into this thing and it was the dis most disgusting cupcake I've ever eaten in my life. You know what it tasted like? Steak. <clears throat> now, I love steak, but not in my cupcake. It was disgusting. As, as I was preparing for today's message, I was thinking about this. And this is like, this is like what's happened in like the, the culture of sexuality around us, right? God gives us this wonderful thing. And we're in this box with something else. And the steak's good, you know, but cupcake, you know, you, you get the metaphor in a second. But we're in the same box. And so what, what kind of has a tendency to happen is those flavors can transfer over to us if we are not guarded in our thoughts. The scriptures in Mont are teach us to keep every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. Why? Because it is so easy for us to start, for us cupcakes to start tasting like steak. Ugh, I can taste it. Ugh, it was disgusting. Don't ever do that, by the way, guys. Ugh. It's like gagging over here. For real, it was the worst cupcake I've ever had in my life. 
And it didn't even touch the stake. It was just in the same culture as it was in. And that's kind of an illustration for where we're at in our society culturally. It's like, like sexual like stuff is all around us. Again, like I think every other ad in my feed sometimes is like, it's trying to appeal on the basis of something that's trying to draw my eyes into it, right? Um, and I have to fight those, those thoughts, those urges, right? So that I'm not, so don't give into it. Right? So that I actually run even when it comes to my mind. Because sex, again, was God's idea. Sexuality was God's idea. How our, how we, how our bodies react, like I'm, I'm trying to keep it PG this time, guys. How our bodies react during it, it, how it feels good is God's idea, God's design. God created, again, the, the order, and he's like, this is good. And so I think it's for, easy for, for something we need to remember in light of this text. When it comes to, some t- to sexual temptation, don't just walk away, run. Guard your hearts, guard your minds, and realize this again, that in Christ Jesus, there is now therefore no condemnation for you. If that is a part of your story, if sexual brokenness is a part of your story, as it is probably the far majority of people us in some form, one form, shape, or another. My gospel application is this. Your freedom was purchased by the death of God's only son, and those in him will never be put to shame. Will never be put to shame. Right, again, there's this thread of grace. I want to be very clear to communicate these next several Sundays as we talk about this idea, because this, again, a Sexual uh, activity affects our bodies and our souls in a way that is unique in human experience. And, and because our culture is so saturated with the brokenness of sexuality, right, we need to be reminded that we were purchased by God's only son when we gave our hearts to him, when we gave our lives, when we decide, made that decision to follow him. He redeemed our past. He justified it, sanctified it, and made us into new, new things on a new direction. And because of that, and because of what God's word promises in Romans, we talk about this idea of no condemnation. If God's promises are true, and I believe they are, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, whether it's in regards to your sexuality, gluttony, idolatry, all of these things. Maybe you've, maybe you've, there, there is quite likely people in here that have struggled with homosexual attraction. It's a part of the broken sexuality in our culture. Like, God is like, you know what? Welcome, right? That is what some of this, the, these church people were. Male prostitutes, homosexual offenders, thieves, greedy people, drunkards, slanderers. Like, that is what some of them were. But because of Jesus, they were washed, sanctified, justified in the name of of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's great news. I hope that's great news to you this morning. It should be.